Good morning, BC. Uh, James here with you, Vinyl Professor. I'm going to do a response to a video that I've uh, just watched. Uh, now, this is a new channel for me, quite a new channel. It's Paul, I believe, uh, fit to be tie-dyed. Um, I discovered Paul, he left a comment on one of my Beatles videos and I went and checked him out and uh, he's got a really good channel. Does a lot of Beatles based stuff, but he does do other things as well. Does a really great album reviews. He throws out some very thought provoking stuff, quite detailed videos, um, you know, a lot of information, uh, just a really good channel. Now, the video that he posted that I thought I definitely want to do a response to this is he did a thing about favourite uh, sides of vinyl, uh, which I thought was a brilliant idea. It's one of those kind of ideas that's so obvious that but you don't think of it, you know. Um, which is your favourite side or sides of a record? And that got me thinking, you know, one of the main reasons that we, you know, love records so much, you know, as opposed to CDs or downloads, um, is that we have that experience, not just of putting the record on, but of changing the record over, you know. And uh, certainly when I was growing up, your whole, the whole way that you engaged with a record uh, was informed by how the music was distributed across the two sides, you know, how the songs built up to, to the end of side one, what the end of side one was actually like, uh, and then how side two started. And, you know, side two was very much part two of the, uh, you know, of the listening experience. And if you're anything like me, um, you know, I never used to interrupt those two sides. It would be side one, turn it over, side two. Um, and there, I mean, there are so many records going back through the years that I could name check, and I've, I've got a pile of them here, um, that I just, I can't separate, I can't unseparate them in my head. It's definitely side one and side two. And I certainly remember when CDs first came around, listening to certain records that I'd, I'd known really well. Uh, and it was very strange hearing the record all the way through and the, and the usual break at the end of side one wasn't there, you know, and sometimes it would it would slightly spoil it for me in a way because you you think to yourself, God, I used to think that song at the end of side one was like really good and used to really finish on a big padel and but on the CD it just seems to finish and then the next track starts and it it just seems really anticlimactic. Um, anyway, what a great huge ramble that was. So this pile of records, there are some records I would argue with anybody are great all-time classic albums but there are some that are just personally special to me um, and each one of them contains one side that I'm particularly fond of. Now just to qualify this, I didn't go for records where I thought side one was fantastic and side two was not very good because that's a slightly different thing. This is records where I like the entire record but side, uh, but side one or side two or side three or side four is my favourite side. Okay, let's get on with it. I want to talk about this one briefly. This is Approved by the Motors, and this was a record, this was the first LP I ever owned as a child. Uh, it came out in 1978, and I was seven years old. I'd seen them do Airport on Top of the Pops. The Motors were a British kind of new wave band, but they were really from the pub rock days. They kind of hitched a ride on, you know, into the new wave era. Uh, and side one of this record, I just absolutely loved. It's got Airport on it, which was a big hit. It's got the other hit single they had, which was Forget About You. And it's got all the other songs are really, really, really great. Now, I, I also used to really like side two, but I loved side one. And I scratched it a bit as a kid. I didn't look after the record properly. And within about six weeks of having the record, side one was basically unplayable. And I was absolutely grief stricken because I just loved side one so much. And I used to I used to put side two on and I would enjoy side two, you know, but I so wanted to hear side one. And uh, my, you know, my parents didn't buy me another copy. They wanted me to learn the lesson the hard way. So it was many years before I got to hear side one of that again but I, it still brings back those memories those frustrated memories of wanting to hear side one and only being able to hear side two okay so the next band and the next record i want to talk about is acdc and power age i got into acdc in my teens and i used to love them but i used to find their music quite kind of not hard work but it was kind of so intense that by the end of side one usually i would sort of 
I would kind of have had enough. Not because I wasn't enjoying it, but because side one of their records always used to build to this kind of tremendous climax, you know, and it would it would kind of not leave you wanting more because it was such a stunning finale to the first side. So often I would just listen to side one over and over again, or I would listen to side one and then just go away and do something else, you know. So to this day, most ACDC albums, I know side one much better than side two. I have now heard all the side twos and I do know the songs, but this album, for example, is just the most incredible first side you can imagine. Give me a bullet, down payment blues, gone shooting, and then it ends with riff raff, which is probably the most awesome sounding end of side one track you'll ever hear in your life. Um, so that that is just a phenomenal side. Okay, so pure nostalgia for the next one. This is Electric Light Orchestra, ELO, Out of the Blue. So this is the first double that I'm showing. And my favourite side of this is actually side three, which is the Concerto for a Rainy Day, which is the big, long, extended suite of songs that climaxes with Mr Blue Sky. Now, when I was growing up, my dad never used to like, uh, you know, pop music, rock music. He was really into classical music. And ELO were one of the sort of only bands that he used to enjoy, mainly because of the orchestras and the choirs and, you know, all the big sort of pretentious pseudo-classical trappings. So we used to listen to this together and it was always side three that we would enjoy the most because I think it's the most sort of, I want to say symphonic, but it's kind of, it's, it's kind of pseudo-symphonic, really, cod-symphonic. He probably didn't enjoy it as much as he pretended to, but I mean, I used to absolutely love it. That's ELO, Out of the Blue. Now this one, nobody would ever make a claim for this album being a fantastic, great classic album. I got into this probably when I was about 12 or 13. I had a cassette of it. I went on holiday to Cornwall with my parents and I found a cassette of this album in a shop and I had just been given a, uh, my first Walkman. So this is one of the first albums I ever heard on a sunny Walkman and the experience of hearing it on headphones just knocked me out. But the side I really enjoyed on this was actually side two. Some People Never Know, which is a nice big long rambling sort of hippie track. I Am Your Singer, which is a bit weak. Then there's a little instrumental cut, which I quite like. And then the side ends with one of McCartney's most underrated songs, Tomorrow, which is probably a better song than after songs he wrote for the White Album. Great little pop song. And then the side finishes with Dear Friend, which was McCartney's... Uh, I think that was McCartney trying to reach out to John Lennon because they were in the middle of all that awful animosity, you know. That song was him trying to reach out with a kind of olive branch, and it's 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 a really touching track. Uh, it's a really beautiful song, you know. So side two of Wildlife, I just love that side. This is an interesting one. Tubular Bells obviously is kind of famous for its side one, which is the piece Tubular Bells. But I used to love side two. Um, you could kind of lose yourself in it more. It was a bit less bumpy, a bit more flowing. I always thought, and it has that great bagpipe section. And it also has the section where he does all that Klingon vocal stuff, all that shagam, and all that stuff. And then it ends with the that uh, sailor's pipe theme, kind of uh, chanty Popeye kind of tune, which I just absolutely love. Side two of that album brings back fantastic memories for me. Just being at home at my parents' house in my bedroom, listening to Tubular Bells and just really digging side two. Okay, I had to pick a Bowie album and I racked my brains a little bit. Now, the obvious choice would have been maybe Low, Side 2, although I do actually prefer Heroes, Side 2. But the one I chose in the end was this one, uh, Diamond Dogs. Side 2 of this, I just absolutely think is fantastic. You know, rock and roll with me. And then it goes into this really sort of apocalyptic um, suite of songs. You've got We Are The Dead. 1984, which has got all that kind of wacka wacka guitar, and uh, I always think it's almost like a black exploitation track. That Big Brother, and then the chant of the ever circling skeletal family. You know, I mean that that is a seriously awesome side of vinyl, isn't it? I mean, side one is great as well, but uh, side two, wonderful. Again, like Bowie, I had to pick a Floyd album. Now I was thinking of Dark Side of the Moon, side one, which I love. Wish You Were Here, side one, which I also love. But in the end, I had to go for metal because of side two, Echoes, which is one big, long, extended track. 
Now I listened to that recently and it was much better than I ever remembered. I always remember it being great, but there's one bit about 20 minutes into the side where it goes into this really kind of ethereal passage and you, you can't quite tell what's going on as in who's playing what instrument. You know, I think Dave Gilmore must have some sort of effect on his guitar. And there's about a minute of just the most incredible, beautiful music, you know, and I thought to myself, yeah, Pink Floyd sometimes don't quite get the credit they deserve. I mean, that sounds a bit of a daft thing to say, because clearly they've had lots of credit over the years. But, uh, yeah, I think side two of, of Metal is really a, a, a really excellent first-rate piece of music. And, of course, it paved the way for Dark Side of the Moon later on, which is the next album, of course. The Doors, their first album. This is an example of what I call a classic bookend side one, in that it starts with an absolutely brilliant song, finishes with an absolutely brilliant song, and then what's in the middle is really good as well. So this starts with Break On Through, one of the great all-time album openers, finishes with Light My Fire, which is one of the great all-time side closers, and then in between you've got Soul Kitchen, Crystal Ship, 20th Century Fox, Alabama Song. Absolutely peerless. Marvin Gay, what's going on? This is an album I've shown several times now. Uh, I'm going to do a special video on this at some point, especially for you, Martin. Uh, but yeah, side two of this. Right on, holy, holy, inner city blues, make me want to holler. Um, I, I mean, I love all this album, but I used to listen to side two over and over again. I had it on CD, strangely enough, uh, but I would listen to those three songs at the end. Uh, over and over again. Uh, very, very spiritual, takes you on a journey. Um, and the final song, uh, Inner City Blues, is a classic example of a song which finishes an album in a slightly unexpected way, a bit like uh, Tomorrow Never Knows on Revolver, in that the album is, it does have a bit of, well, a, you know, a fair bit of social anger and so on, but it's quite a kind of uplifting musically, whereas that song at the end, Inner City Blues is actually quite dark, genuinely, you know, uh, and it builds up through the song Holy Holy, which kind of builds to this kind of great big, almost want to say orgasmic kind of uh, soul orchestral sound, you know, absolutely like, I think it was Marvin Gaye's Wall of Sound, really. Wonderful. Again, another side two surfs up, we have Feel Flows, which has got to be one of the greatest tracks ever by Carl Wilson. I mean, when I first heard that track, I was living in a shared house with somebody at the time, and this guy came home, and I just finished listening to it for the first time, and I said, you've got to hear this. I've just heard the greatest track in the universe, you know, and I put it on for him, and we sat and listened to it, and he was like, wow, that is amazing, you know. And then it's Looking at Tomorrow, A Day in the Life of a Tree, Till I Die, all of which are good, not really amazing, but then it ends with Surf's Up which is my favourite Beach Boys track and one of my all-time favourite songs. So for a side to start with Feel Flows and then to end with Surf's Up, just incredible. Uh, Jeff Party talked about this quite recently on a video. He made an entire video about this album. This is On the Beach by Neil Young. Side two of this is very special. It contains just two, I think, or three songs, very slow, very drawn out. It's a bit of a downer as a side. It's not something that, it's not something that you'd put on to entertain your friends or to sort of you know cheer yourself up. But it puts you into the zone. It puts you into a very particular place. You know, you, you can light a candle and you can lie in the dark and you can listen to that album and it will kind of take you somewhere. It won't allow you to float off, but it will definitely take you take you to a particular place inside yourself. You know, it's quite. Uh, yeah, it's quite an intense side of vinyl, that, on the beach by Neil Young, side two. Complete contrast, George Harrison's Cloud Nine album. I've always loved side one of this. It starts with Cloud Nine, which is a really good, a classic kind of side opener, you know. Moves through to That's What It Takes, which has got Clapton on guitar, a lovely track. Fish on the Sand, which is a brilliant sort of, you know, Beatles-y, upbeat kind of song. Then it has Just For Today, which, because you have to have a kind of slow melancholy song. Then This Is Love, which picks things up again and is quite uh, jolly and Beatlesy. And then it finishes with When We Was Fab, uh, which is one of George's all-time big hit singles. So again, side two is good as well, but side one 
uh, is great. I had to have a side four in this collection, so I've gone for London Calling by The Clash. It's a classic example, this, of an album which is fantastic all the way through and it really sustains itself and gets to side four and really delivers. So you end up thinking, wow, I think of all the sides, side four is actually my favourite, which is quite an achievement for an album as good as this, really. Okay, so the final one I want to show you is what I consider to be the greatest side of vinyl in my entire collection. It contains, let's have a look, it contains one, two, three, four, one, two, three, five songs, and it is this album, The Rolling Stones, Hot Rocks, 1964 to 1971, and side three contains, starts with Jumping Jack Flash, moving through on to Street Fighting Man, moving through to Sympathy for the Devil, continuing with Honky Tonk Women, and finishing with Gimme Shelter. Need I say more? If somebody was to say to me, explain to me what is great about the Stones, or even explain to me what is great about rock and roll, I would simply go to this record and I would play them side three. <laughs> it makes me smile just thinking about it. I think I might put it on. Anyway, Paul, good luck with this thread. I hope you get some more responses. It is a fantastic idea. I so enjoyed digging out these records and talking about them. If you've not checked out Paul's channel, I'll put the link below. Fit to be tie-dyed. And uh, I'll see you soon, BC. Have a great day. Bye.